Okay, we're going to get started in a few moments. Encourage everyone to have a seat. And uh, good afternoon. Uh, for those of you who are uh, perhaps just joining us, I want to welcome you to the 2020 uh, Breakthrough Prize Symposium. Uh, this is a, a fabulous event, and I'm going to be uh, moderating for the next afternoon session. My name is Tejal Desai, and I am professor and chair of bioengineering at UCSF. And uh, as a bioengineer, this is especially exciting to me um, as someone who has really been interested in bringing together physical sciences with biological sciences. Uh, we're seeing the whole gamut of that today and really seeing how fundamental advances in all these different disciplines are really going to change the way we interact and perceive of the world. Uh, I'm especially excited to have this afternoon session, which again uh, showcases uh, how fundamental science has really been transformed by uh, interesting observations, uh, which maybe otherwise would have been overlooked had it not been for uh, our wonderful scientists here today. So I'm going to begin the session by introducing uh, Daniel Friedman. Daniel Friedman is an emeritus professor of physics and applied mathematics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, he's also a visiting professor at Stanford University. And he's one of the winners of this year's special breakthrough prize uh, in fundamental physics. And this is actually an occasional prize. It is um, only offered or awarded for extraordinary achievements in physics, but can aw be awarded at any time. And so now is the time. And this year's special prize recognizes the 1976 discovery of supergravity, a theory of fundamental particles and forces that has really proved highly influential and has shaped generations of scientists and physicists to come. The title of his talk is, Does Nature Know About Supersymmetry and Supergravity? Why don't we give a, a round of applause? Thank you very much. Well, the title's been modified a bit, as you can see. Well, when you're 80 years old, you have a lot to look backward to. And I say that to indicate that I might prefer to talk about the past, but I'll do my best to address the future. What I plan is a qualitative argument for the realization of supersymmetry and supergravity. It's not a rigorous argument. It wouldn't satisfy Alex. But I hope you find it's a vigorous argument, and it's one that I've really felt, felt, felt compelling through the years. But I have to caution you, because until a few years ago, many theorists found the vigorous argument called naturalness very compelling. This argument predicted that at least some of the heavy particles predicted by supersymmetry and required by supersymmetry would be produced at the LHC. And that did not happen. So theorists can talk, but nature speaks last. Let me begin with a few definitions. These are very informal definitions, and I think it'll help to set the tone. I want to talk about two symmetries, global supersymmetry and gauge symmetry. In a global supersymmetry, the, the transformation you make, the parameters of that transformation, which could be an angle, are constant in space-time. And in a, local, in a gauge symmetry, they are arbitrary functions of space-time. So you can think of a checkerboard, and on that checkerboard, you have a bunch of needles on every square. And a global transformation would be you, you rotate every single one of those 64 needles by 30 degrees. A gauge transformation, uh, you, each, each square can un undergo a, a transformation by whatever angle uh, you dial. Now, global symmetries are important, but gauge symmetries are more important because they have historically uh, and mathematically led to new forces in nature. So global supersymmetry is the only symmetry principle that, can, uh, re that relates particles uh, of different spin. Uh, I'm sorry, my I can't focus very well on that. It is a candidate for the physics beyond the standard model but it is not yet confirmed because the heart heavy particles have not yet been detected. Supergravity is a gauge theory. 
which combines supersymmetry and general relativity, and it brings gravity and quantum uh, physics closer together, quantum mechanics closer together. So here's my argument. It's gauge principles play a vital role in quantum field theory. Quantum field theory is a language we use for particle physics uniformly. There are rigorous theorems that tell us there are only three gauge principles that allow interactions among particles and with gravity. There's a spin one gauge principle, which is realized in quantum theories of electromagnetism and the weak and strong interactions. There's a spin two gauge principle, which is very important, indeed vital to the classical theory of gravity, which is Einstein's general relativity. And the only one permitted by theorems is the spin three halves gauge field, and it's that gauge principle that's embedded in supersymmetry and supergravity. So Susie, as I more or less said, is a very powerful symmetry that relates particles of different spin. Every known particle has a heavier superpartner. Negative LHC results on the searches for those particles have uh, come up short, and that means that the superparticle masses must, must exceed 2 TeV, which is the energy rate of the LHC accelerator in Geneva. And just for, for perspective, 2 TeV is 16 times the mass of the Higgs particle. Oops, I think I went too far. I'm sorry, I skipped too, skipped too soon. Uh, let me just say that an elementary particle is described by a quantum field. It can be massless or has, has to have a positive mass, and quantum mechanics forces the spin to be either integer or half integer. There are two classes of particles in nature. The bosons all have integer spin. They include the Higgs, newly discovered a few years ago, which is, uh, has spin zero, described by a scalar function in space and time. Uh, the photon has spin one, it's described by a vector field. The graviton has spin two, and it's described by a tensor field, a field with two indices. Uh, fermions are also abundant if you have, they have spin a half. Among them are the electron, the quark, they all have spin a half. It's also described by a different type of four component object, the spinner field psi alpha of x. If the gravitino is eventually discovered, uh, it will be described, it will have spin three halves, and it will be described by a vector spinner, four times four or 16 components. Let's try to define the spin one gauge field. If I can focus on it. The focus, the photon is described by a vector field, a mu of x, and you make a transformation in, it, in, this, in the equations of, of electromagnetism. Everywhere you see a mu, you replace it by a mu plus the derivative or the gradient of theta, where theta is the gauge parameter. It's an arbitrary function. And the equations of electromagnetism remain unchanged under this transformation. And that invariance properties of the equations ensures that the, the interactions are consistent. The spin one gauge principle we've already said gauge, ga governs the, the three forces which are, which are explored by accelerator physics and at the LHC accelerator. And ex ex that, that experimental exploration and the accompanying theory have led us to the standard model of those three forces. I should emphasize that the, the electroweak and strong theories are quantum theories. I will not attempt to define quantum theories here. I'll just give the buzzwords, uh, probabilities, particles as waves. In the 21st century, you must use the word entanglement. General relativity is a classical theory, on the other hand. You can make, our, in principle, make our measurements to arbitrary accuracy. Its gauge field is the metric tensor, which me measures distance in space-time. And it has a, a related gauge transformation. They always involve derivatives of a gauge parameter. But the metric tensor, cha tensor changes by a symmetric derivative of a x gauge function c mu of x, which is an arbitrary vector. 
Measurements of the bending of light by, the star, by a star by, show that the graviton has spin too. General relativity is a beautiful theory. It's widely applicable. Some of the uh, applications are listed here. Uh, as time goes by and tests get sharper and sharper, Einstein's theory looks better and better. However, gravity must be quantized. One cannot accept a world in which three of the fundamental forces are quantum mechanical, hence probabilistic, but while gravity remains classical and deterministic. Among the many difficulties associated with quantization of the gravitational field are uncontrolled infinities in quantities that are, in principle, observable. OK, now comes the star of the show, supersymmetry and supergravity. Global supersymmetry is a theory in flat space time with gravity ignored. And the force between two elementary particles is so weak that it's a completely safe assumption in practice to neglect gravity. In principle, you cannot neglect gravity. Gravity must be, fo must be quantized because otherwise you don't derive the force that's holding us to our chairs. Here's an example of a supersymmetric system, a scalar field phi and a sp spinner field psi. And Susie transformations mix scalars with spinners. You see the phi changes into psi multiplied by the transformation parameter. It's a global symmetry, so the transformation parameter is a constant four-component spinner. And a psi rotates into the, a, a, a gradient of the scalar field, again times epsilon. As in many symmetries, as in, uh, in physics, the important structure is revealed by making a repeated transformation. First, you let phi, say, transform with parameter epsilon prime. It turns into psi. You then transform it again with uh, parameter epsilon. It turns back into, in, into phi again. You subtract the order of the two. And you find that, as I said, phi goes into phi. Similarly, psi goes into psi. But the space-time point is, ch is changed. It's translated by an amount c mu, where c mu is a constant vector formed by the spinner's epsilon bar and epsilon prime. So what's happening here is the fields are undergoing a, a translation in space-time. So symmetry thus unifies the quantum mechanical treatment of spin with space-time geometry. So SUSY certainly involves the structure of space-time. And so does gravity. We all know that from Einstein's GR. So this is at least a hint that a marriage between global supersymmetry and general relativity will be a happy marriage. But a constant spinner is not allowed in a gravity theory. It's incompatible with aspects of the spin two gauge principle. You must promote epsilon, epsilon alpha from a constant to an arbitrary function of space time. So this means that, uh, and this is, this is the ingredient of supergravity theory, supersymmetry must hold as a gauge symmetry. So, Let's talk a little bit more about supergravity. Not much. I, don't want to, I can't show the real equations. They would fill more than one transparency. The, super, su, the supersymmetric partner of the gravitational field is the gravitino field. It's a vector spinner. And the, its gauge parameter is an arbitrary spinner field, spinner function of space time. Here are the gauge transformations. You see that psi. Uh, is the gauge field of, of, super, of supersymmetry. It, um, its transform involves the covariant derivative of the gauge parameter. So it, you find the derivative, derivative structure common to all gauge transformations. And this quantity omega mu uh, uh, contains derivatives of the uh, gravitational field. And, the, and the met, Einstein's metric tensor rotates into something proportional to epsilon and, and, the, and the gravitino. So it is in this way that the graviton is identified with its partner, the gravitino. So this is n equal one supergravity with one graviton and one graviton, one gravitino, as we found it in 1976. So this ends my ba basic argument. Let me recap it. I, what I say is that supersymmetry utilizes 
the only consistent gauge principle that has not appeared in nature. It unites space-time geometry with quantum mechanical spin. These are very deep principles, and that justifies my hope that uh, experiment will eventually confirm it, perhaps even in the next 10 years. There's one more slide I would like to show to illustrate the further development of, of the theory. There are many, many different models which have been constructed in which you take the gravity multiplet, spin two and spin three halves, and couple it to lower spin multiplets, so ha one half zero and, and one one half. And there are many applications to ex accelerator experiments and dark matter searches. There are also models of extended supergravity. Super they all contain one graviton, but they contain any number up to eight gravitini and lower spins. Okay. The maximum theory n, ma n max equal eight has special properties with respect to its ultraviolet structure. It is proven to be free of ultraviolet divergences up to six loop order in Feynman diagrams. And some people believe, perhaps not me, but some people believe that it, this miracle whole of a finite theory of gravity holds to all orders. There are also models in all space-time dimensions from d equal two up to d equal 11. That's the maximum space-time dimensions which uh, permit this principle to be realized consistently. And uh, that raises the question, what is the relation between supergravity and uh, superstring theories? Well, let's just say that they've had a very, very productive, productive relation for the last 43, 43 years. There are many, many applications to black holes, to inflationary cosmologies, many applications to the ADS-CFT correspondence, which has pervaded theoretical physics for 20 years now, and even to new mathematics. And there's one number that says it all. There's the INSPIRE archive, which uh, tabulates physics papers on a daily basis. It lists, over the past 43 years, 15,702 papers in which supergravity enters either in the title or as a keyword. So you see, it's too big to fail. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello. This side, uh, on your right, Dan. Yes. I, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about, you said it had inspired some new mathematics. Um, can you tell us any more about what sort of branches of mathematics? Uh, I'm has... sorry, I'm not understanding you. So you, you mentioned that uh, it, um, su uh, supergravity had inspired some new mathematics uh, outside of physics. Could you well, tell us a little bit more about what, what kind of mathematics? Uh, new types of manifolds and differential geometry. They come out of n equal two super, uh, supergravity. And, and, and the is, mathematicians have embraced them. And is that something that mathematicians and physicists work together on? Or is, is, are mathematicians kind of off on their own on that one, leaving the physicists in their way? I, think, I would say both mathematicians have, and physicists have further developed the issue of special, the special geometry manifolds. I think I see a question right here. I don't see a microphone. Thank you. So what do you think should we do uh, if we didn't find yet those uh, super uh, symmetry particles in the LHC? So what do you think does it mean? Or what should we do in the future in order to find them, in your opinion? We can do one of two things. We can build higher energy accelerators. That's an expensive and largely highly political issue. There's, an issue, there's also a, a, a question of what is, dark, what is the particle responsible for cold dark matter? Supersymmetry models have a candidate, which, and, one, and it's also possible that the gravitino will be cold dark matter. Uh, those experiments take place in deep mines, their budgets are measured in a few millions of dollars rather than a few billions of dollars. They've been going on, the searches have been going on for about 20 years yet. They haven't yet yielded positive results. 
but I hope they get lucky. Hey, Dan, with the, uh, it sounds like the Graviton, you believe, is pretty well established that it's there, and the Gravitino is the one that's in question. Is that a fair statement? That's, that's the truth. No one should be, no one should doubt the Graviton. Okay. <laughs> that should be on your bumper sticker somehow. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, Do, if, if the Gravitino is a candidate for cold dark matter, does that mean it doesn't interact with a photon at all? And is that true for gravitons also? Well, the Gravitino is, is neutral, so it doesn't direct, uh, that does not directly uh, in, interact with photons. Thank you very much.